Thank you so very, very much. All right. I guess I'll warm up with a little songy song. This is what I usually warm up with. Let's see. Make sure the sound is there. We got that there. Let's put this one up here. We put that one there. We'll make that one up like that. We'll take this one. We'll put it on the finger. I'll explain this later. And let's make sure these are down and that's like that. And we got sound here. Jack from Peach Guitars here, and it's my great pleasure today to be joined by Mr. Ron Thal. Thank you so much you for having me. You might know better as Bumblefoot. Mr. Bumblefoot, absolute pleasure. My to pleasure, meet you. thank you. How's yeah. the UK treating you so far? Wonderfully. We've had this odd, warm, sunny, blue sky, amazing weather. You're right, yeah. Oh, I'm loving it. Yeah. Towards the end of February here, and we've had a freak heat wave, which has been really nice. Well, I say heat wave. It's mm. not heat, but it's, it's better than snow, which we had last year. So Hotter wave. Yeah, you came at a good time. Yeah, I so um, glad to hear it's all, it's all treating you well. And you're back home tomorrow, tomorrow. I believe. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's so, been yeah. a good run. Uh, flew in from Thailand and landed 6.30 in the morning, got picked up, and we drove right down to the BIM school in Bristol and did a day there, then went up to Birmingham, did BIM there, and then Manchester did it there, and then that great Birmingham uh, guitar show. Two days there. Then went to Brighton and did a BIM school there. And there is a school in Whitney in Oxford called the Bumblefoot uh, Rock Project, Bumblefoot really? Rock School. And we take young, most adorable kids and set them up in bands and put them right to work. Sure, they learn Amazing. the instrument and everything, but they get right into bands. And they're writing songs, they're recording, they're making music videos, doing everything a band does, doing shows and getting them right into it. All in your name. That's amazing. Yeah, we, it was a, a great school that's been around about 10 years. I met up with them nine years ago and we always stayed close and there was sort of uh, rebuilding everything. And they asked me a few years ago, I said, can we kind of partner up and, and do something and, and we want to name it after you. And I'm like, I'm not worthy, no. But yeah. That's so I, was just, I spent the day there and jammed with the kids and did a, a clinic and did like a storyteller show at night, which is always fun because I do them without any plan. I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know what I'm going to play and just kind of wing it. Someone will yell something out and next thing you know, we're off on some tangent. Uh, someone yelled out Boston. So pretty much played a good minute of every song from the first Boston album, just going through them all. Random things like that. Yeah. It's just a lot of fun. That's yeah. amazing. So not only are you here for musical purposes, you're also here on humanitarian causes then, it sounds. Oh, well, it's kind of one and the same if you think about it. I mean, isn't that what music is in a big way? I guess so. Yeah. I guess so. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have said that about myself. I just play guitar, but that's, that's pretty, does it make that's pretty in depth. I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know about that, but I bet it does. from the sound of things, yeah, playing guitar does make people happy. Ron's here to do a clinic with us here at Peach this afternoon, or this evening. We've just uh, been Witnessing sound check, filmed a little bit, recorded a bit. Switch pickups. So we're really yeah. looking forward to tonight. It's going to be a good, good, good show. Yeah, thank you for having me. 
So yeah. let's just, before we get onto the main reason that you're here, which is Vigier guitars, mm. let's just take it back a little bit. If you could give us a little bit of kind of backstory. How did you get into this scene and how did it lead you to where you are now? What, what prompted you to pick up the guitar in the first place? Ah, it's a long backstory. I was five years old. I'm 17 now, so maybe it's not that long. Uh, why are you all laughing? Short version. Okay, okay, edit. Ah, so <laughs> I was five years old and I heard the Kiss Alive album. It just came out and as soon as I heard it, just like many musicians, something about that record, it just made me want to do this. And by the time I was six, I had a band. We were making multi-track recordings using multiple cassette recorders and just figure it out using what we have to make that happen. And I would hand draw merch, making little handwritten comic books and cutting up paper and making cups of confetti to throw in the air at the end of the shows <laughs> that we would play in my backyard, mom's basement, the school we went to, and just never stopped. And that's it. So That's amazing. So you everything. got in there with Kiss. That's yeah. getting in a big way. And it was a great, uh, what's the word? Uh, they were a great model to watch on what a band uh, can do, should do mm -hmm. for a kid. And we just followed their lead. And that was it. And it just never stopped. And 40 something years later, still doing it. Only now I don't cut up my own confetti anymore. Yeah, but you've still got elements of that showmanship and it served you well throughout oh, your career. Yeah, still does the, the little... <laughs> Kiss fan myself, nice. and I can hear there's a little bit of kind of Ace Freelyisms in your playing. I kind of would term it like that kind of controlled chaos oh, cool. that you do really well, and I think that Freely was a big, a big kind of um, proponent of that. I would say. What I loved about Ace Freely is he made guitar solos that you could sing, and not in the melodic Neil Sean way, but in a rock and roll way that you could just sing the riffs. Mm -hmm. uh, that's skill I feel like I was never able to achieve, like it just wasn't in my blood, uh, I don't know. But that's something that he did so well, and that's what you love about Kiss. Like mm -hmm. You can, sure, you know, of course you can sing the vocal parts, but it's the guitar parts you want to sing. Yeah, it's magic All stuff, souls. it's brilliant. Yeah. So how did you make the transition from Kiss to kind of the more technical side of playing, and when did that come in for you? Just. Growing up in the 70s and being exposed to the amazing music that was just surrounding you constantly, it was a time when every album that came out every week was something just iconic. It's like, hey, here's a new one from Pink Floyd. Next week, there's a new one from Led Zeppelin, followed by a new one from ACDC, and then here's one from The Who, and then you got this. Just every mm -hmm. single thing was great. Some new queen for you. Uh, 
Yeah. Everything was great, so it's impossible to not be inspired all the time. Every kind of music. Uh, new band called the Sex Pistols. Check it out. Yeah. Everything. That was doesn't great. happen anymore. Well, you just have to look harder to find it. But back then, just everything was nurtured and brought to this level of amazing. And it doesn't even matter what kind of music it was. Whatever it was, it was just fucking great. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So you were surrounded by all this great music that just leached into your DNA. And it was just part of you. And an inspiration for you, a building block of you musically. And uh, I had all these neighbors that I was friends with who all had older brothers and sisters that had all these albums lying around and you just pick up a random album and put it on and you're exposed to just the greatest stuff. So I remember listening to Yes at a very early age uh, and just loved it. So from that point, you start getting into that and the ELP and, and uh, Jethro Tull and just all this great musical music. Mm -hmm. school metal which at the time was just you know this new sound called heavy metal and hearing Are Your Maiden for the first time just browsing the record store and picking up the Killers album and looking at it it's like this looks so cool it's got to be good and you take it home and immediately you run right back to the store it's like give me everything they made you mm -hmm. know, get the first album made in Japan I got and, uh, that kind of thing it was just music's I wouldn't say heyday because if anything there's more music now uh, and more accessibility to it, but it was just a height of great stuff. Yeah, a lot of that stuff so, was still brand new at the time as well. Yeah. So you so, were kind of right place, right time situation for you, I guess. Yeah, and from there you just get exposed to more and more stuff and you go down the rabbit hole. Oh, so, you know, this guy Bill Bruford, this drummer, he, you know, and yes, he also played in this band King Crimson. Let me check that out. Oh, wow. And that guy, he was in this, and he, you know, and, and next thing you know, you're exploring the whole genre and all, you know, the the families and, and trees and branches of it all. Mm. Yeah. So you're just a guy that loves music, it seems. Yeah. Yeah. And you expand into other stuff. So, I mean, I love Motown. I love 60s and 70s. I, I love Tom Jones. I love Manowar. And yeah. Yeah, Those just, two go together quite well anyway. I think. They do. Tom Jones and Man of War, they yeah. can go together very well. In fact, I made an album that almost kind of did that. <laughs> uh, I would really have fun with my own records and each record, not that I even intended it to, you just, you just have this vibe and you run with it. And I had an album called Uncool and the vocals all sounded like lounge music, but the music was heavy. Right. And there was a term for it that they dubbed it in France. They called it crooncore. Crooncore. Fantastic. And I would tour out there and they would, I'd be dressed in this like, cheesy, corny uh, clothing that I would find, like, like these like, shark skin uh, suits and these like, big glasses. And, and I just try to look as, as out of date and uncool as possible. And there'd be all these people crowd surfing and uh, to all this weird ass heavy lounge music. <laughs> it was a great experience, it was. It's something that you just, <laughs> you gotta laugh when you think about it. Yeah. 
It was really cool. I'd like to see that. Uncool. I'm going to get on YouTube for that then, I guess. It's hard to find. This was like 2000, 2001, but there, there's some things out there you could find. Brilliant. Yeah. All in the name of rock and roll. Yeah. Or crooncore, in this case. That's fantastic. Yeah. So that kind of variety obviously served you really well throughout your career, because I know you've done, you've just done tons of stuff. You've constantly recorded with different artists, contributed solos to X, Y, and Z, and kind of how did that fall into place? Was it just a natural thing, or did you kind of go through a period where you, you well, sought out work, or did it just come to you? I would always, no matter what I learned, I would teach it. And to me, that's a big part of the spirit of being a musician. I heard Kiss. And it just did something to my, my insides that I just felt like I wanted to make other people, if I could make other people the way, feel the way that made me feel, uh, then I serve a purpose <laughs> in this life. Uh, I want to do that. And it's the same thing. Someone shows you music and you want to share it. You want to show people that music. You want to make music too. You have to think about the string. This is, I'm just going to let you know like my thought process, how I found the way to get the notes beyond the fretboard so that you no longer even need the fretboard. So, first we start off with the string. It's vibrating from here to here 110 times a second. Ready? Count. 110. So, everyone go like this. Ah, I will do this for the next two hours if you don't. Ah. Thank you. At least three of you. Okay. You're larynx is opening and closing 110 times a second just going so fast that it reaches a point that we recognize it as that pitch of sound that goes ah uh, ah uh, ah uh, ah uh. good if you were to take a length of string that's vibrating and cut it exactly in half it'll vibrate twice as fast and that's what we call an octave when you have whatever speed something is vibrating, whatever that frequency is, any multiple of that number is an octave. So you have, uh, let's say we cut it in half, down to 55. Everybody go. Uh, come on, manly men. Who dares to hit 55? All right, 55, 110, let's go the other way then. 220, you cut it in half, you divide it, okay, you got twice as much, 220 times. Ready, here we go. Ah, it's an easy one. Thank you all so much. Let's double that and go to the next octave. Like your tuner that says 440, that's what it's talking about. 440 little vibrations that you want to match this to. So, everyone go. Good. Let's go to 880. Nobody, come on. There we go. Thank you. All right, fancy pants. Let's take it up. A little bit now. So let's double that up. 1760. You ready, Mariah? Uh, someone shows you how to make music. You want to do that too. You want to share that back. You hmm. want to give that back and show people how they can make music too. Uh, they, they go together very much. So whatever I was learning I would also teach it uh, and whatever I just whatever I did I would share it so I had my own little studio and I would make my own recordings and then I would bring in bands and record them from doing that you slowly become like a producer and they start saying hey what would you do here uh, you know what about this and, and you start getting creative and, and that starts to happen and you have your own studio and other people start coming in and they recommend their friends and different styles of music. So there was one point where I was recording a lot of hardcore bands. Mm. And there was a point right after that that I was recording a lot of hip hop, hip -hop bands. I had studio in Staten Island right around the area where the Wu-Tang guys were. 
So right. sometimes like second and third level clan guys would come in and we would record and, and there was just some great hip hop over there. And then I got to get a good understanding of what makes it tick. And that starts to bleed into your own music. Uh, so all those things that, that you're exposed to and become part of, uh, yeah, it's a building block in what you do. Mm. And it shows itself at some point. Yeah, absolutely. And then next thing you know, you're making this weird ass music, you know, putting in ingredients that may not go together, but if they're part of who you are and, and you're being you know, authentically you, it'll show itself in some way and it'll be there and it'll go together. Yeah. Or maybe not. But no, that's <laughs> it's right. authentically you. It all, goes, all worse. it all goes in the bank and it comes yeah. out as yeah. yourself. Yeah. And that's that's kind of how I think of it is that everything that affects you in some way musically, uh, it's like a brick in the structure that you are. And at some point when you're making music, you could point out the bricks and say, oh, that's when I heard that Bowie song and I had that offbeat thing and I really dug it. I kind of stole that and did it here. Oh, and that's from that Beatles album where they took that cello line and they went to the dominant seventh. It was just wrong, but it worked. And I'm doing that here. Like all that kind of stuff happens. Sometimes that's the curse of a musician, isn't it? To, you, to constantly be in kind of analytic mode where you're constantly focusing on these little details and trying to backtrack and figure out where you got them from. Mm -hmm. It's a curse and a blessing because yeah. you can uh, decode everything. You could, you could decode the matrix and if you want to teach it, if you want to show someone else how to do it or explain it or just understand it, you know the language, you know why and you can do that. But yeah, at the same time it could ruin things because you don't see the room anymore, you see all the green squiggles. Mm -hmm. So It can be tough. Yeah, but, but I think but it makes in the end it's a, it's a good thing. Yeah. You want to know the language, you want to know that, okay, I want it to be happy, major third, uh, but I want it to be a little edgy, so we can throw in the dominant seventh, uh, but I want it to be a little off, let's flatten that five, you know, and it has that, you know, you know how to do it, you know how to say what you want to say mm -hmm. when you really uh, explore the vocabulary, I should say, yeah. It's important. So let's talk about what you're saying these days. So mm. musically, on the go, you've got a couple of cu couple of main musical projects on the go at the moment, I believe. So Art of Anarchy dates back a few years ago. That one, yeah. Is it still running to this day? Still that one is on a hiatus. Uh, yeah, that was with, with John Moyer on bass from Disturbed. Uh, our first singer was Scott Weiland. And our second singer, Scott Stapp from Creed. And put out an album with each. Uh, right now, Main thing is Sons of Apollo. Mm -hmm. So that is a band, Mike Portnoy on drums from Dream, Dream Theater and many other great things. Uh, Billy Sheehan on bass, two of them have winery dogs together. Uh, Derek Sherinian on keyboards, who was uh, with Mike in Dream Theater about 20 years ago, so it's almost like a reunion band for them. I'm on guitar. And Jeff Scott Soto, the amazing vocalist, uh, is in there too. And like we all know each other, and we've played together and done so many things over the years, so it was kind of an organic get-together. Uh, I've done Progressive Nation at Sea jamming with Derek, Mike, and Billy. I've been the house band for a uh, big radio event for Eddie Trunk, a famous radio host uh, in New York where me, Mike, and Billy were the house band and we jammed with Ace Frilly and Peter Chris from KISS and did a bunch of old KISS songs and the guys from Anthrax and, and nice. stuff like that. We've all done things together. I've laid uh, guest guitar solos for Madame Mayhem, an artist that Billy produced. and like So we're all interconnected and have done a lot of things uh, over the years. Mm. So I got an email from Mike. It's like, hey, you know how we always talk about putting a band together? Well, me and Derek have this idea, and we're picturing this, this, and this. Uh, we want to jump into the studio in early March. Are you free? And I'm, I was, and I was like, yeah, let's do it. So we just ran into the studio. Uh, beforehand, we had a couple of ideas that each of us just had as a springboard to start working off of. And 11 days in the studio, we wrote and recorded the whole record. And now, well, after that, we did a whole bunch of touring, 
did that all last year. And then we started doing the same thing end of last year and early this year we recorded uh, the bed tracks for the new album, the next album. Mm -hmm. And when I get home I'm gonna finish tweaking my guitar tracks and by the end of the year that should come out and hopefully in 2020 we'll be touring all over yeah, again. Yeah, look forward to that. And besides that I'm just doing my own music, uh, yeah, just bumblefoot stuff. It's been a long time since I've done uh, instrumental stuff, just solely instrumental. I might stick one or two on an album, uh, mainly on the singer, uh, singer, guitar player. And I started not even by choice. Uh, I was on Shrapnel Records in mid 90s and they wanted me to do an instrumental album to start things. Hmm. When I signed with them, the idea is that it would be my band and we would just do the band stuff this wacky kind of system of a down primus vibe mm -hmm. music and it was all vocal music and once we signed he said ah, can you just do a guitar instrumental album so I did uh, so it started with that and it's been a long time since I've done an instrumental album so I'm starting to write some guitar music <laughs> sides of the string. up a whole record try and get some some really good guests on there yeah I'll ask all my friends and I think it's important to do both isn't it but it was great to yeah. hear I was really pleased to hear some vocals going on in the in the sound check cool. I'm looking forward yeah. to more of that in the clinic because it's just not it's nice to hear guitar in the context of what you would traditionally think of as a song I mean obviously yeah. the instrumental stuff is is fantastic mm -hmm. and it's, it still speaks in a different way but it's always good to have some vocals in there it's like this is one language and this is the other language yeah. and it's nice to get both if you can. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's and great. I was always a band guy. I was a guy that, you know, I, you know, Kiss and the Beatles, those are my first two. And the two bands that you know the members on a first name basis, John, Paul, George, Ringo, uh, Peter Race, Paul, Gene. Uh, you know the band, you know what those names mean, even musically. Uh, when you think of George, you have a sound, you have a musical identity that is a key ingredient to that one-of-a-kind mix. Mm. And that's what I always loved about bands and that's what I always wanted. So people might know that I play guitar, and, and, but a lot of times they don't know that I sing. And, and really all my, my albums, pretty much vocal albums, uh, it just sounds like a band. Right, yeah. okay.
Once upon a time a child grew up too fast when running wild Now we don't know who to pray to anymore I once thought God was good and kind Then Mother Nature blew my mind And left my broken body on the floor And now I don't know who to pray to anymore To me, this was always a tool to make the song. Uh, it's a way for each member to express their identity, but ultimately, our purpose together is to build a song, and the song is what matters. I think it was, yeah, it was hearing Eddie Van Halen for the first time. Uh, I heard, you know, heard Mean Street, and that's when <coughs> the light bulb went off, and I realized, wow. Well, this thing is more than that. It's this mm. innovative tool that, that, you know, it's not that you use it for a song. You know, it's almost like this can be your main thing and this could be the focal point of the song, not just in the moment of a guitar solo or a musical spot, but this is like a real standalone, powerful weapon right here. Uh, and this one, <laughs> that is quite uh, a tool, yeah. as it were. So yeah, Vigier Guitars is the primary reason that we're seeing you today. Yes, yes. Let's talk a little bit about that. So how did the relationship kind of establish itself in the first place with these guys? Because you've been with them for quite a while now. 21 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or going on 22, actually. Right. Yeah. Uh, I was doing a clinic tour in France in 1997. And up to that point, uh, I would kind of make my own guitars. I would modify uh, different guitars and, and just make these horrible monstrosities, these things. Uh, made a double neck, only my double neck had, it was a Stratocaster, an X Stratocaster, where I took a bass neck and I cut it this way. I chopped it at the seventh fret. So it was just this bass neck this long and I sunk it into the horn sticking out of this and I put a little DiMarzio Super Distortion right there and a badass bridge, wired it to its own volume knob and had a three-way uh, neck selector and refretted the neck where it would be like an octave hmm. guitar where the open was your 12th and, and the spacing and they were all crooked and off and this thing just screamed out, hit a note on it and people would just be going like this and the little punk ass obnoxious kid that I was, I just loved that. Uh, I was torturing people. And uh, yeah, so things like that I would make. Vigier, they brought one of their guitars, just they made normal single neck guitars and, and did it really well. They brought their Excal Excalibur model, they brought to one of my clinics and I said, hey, try this out. And I was very just, no, I make my own guitars. I'm not looking for an endorsement, not interested. Please just leave me alone and let me just do my thing. Uh, like, just try it. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not looking for an endorsement, blah, blah, blah. Just try it. It's like, all right, all right, I tried it. And I played the thing. And, and, and at that point, I think the main guitar that I would bring out and use was this, it was called the Swiss cheese guitar. And it was an, a 1983 Ibanez Roadstar that I saved up when I was 12 years old for about a year and a half painting Iron Maiden albums on the backs of dungaree jackets for $20 a pop. And that's how I would save up money to get gear. And I was, and I was 14 and went and got it. And first thing I did when I took it home 
I don't know why, I don't know what drove me to do it, but I took this like a spatula and a hammer and I chiseled off all the paint. And I immediately just started doing all kinds of weird things to it. And at one point, uh, remember I wanted to make it look like I took a bite out of it, but it didn't quite work. It didn't look right. And now I just have this weird shaped chunk missing here. <laughs> so I was like, ah, fuck it. And I just started getting all different drill bits, different sizes and drilled a million holes in it and getting along the edges and everything. And then I looked at it and I was like, yeah. And I went uh, to uh, uh, an automotive store where they, they sell automotive paint and I brought a slice of Swiss cheese with me and I slapped it on the counter. I was like, can you match this color? And the guy just looks at me with this weird look and I'm just looking at him laughing. And he's like, we could do that. They did it. And, yeah, and painted it up and it became the Swiss cheese guitar. And I put uh, DeMarzio's in it and a five-way toggle. And, and that was my main guitar. This $180 guitar for 13 years was the one I toured with and recorded with and did everything with. Uh, and that's what I had with me, uh, touring through. And then Vigier said, hey, try one of our guitars. And reluctantly, I did. As soon as I got my hands on it, I was like, wow, this is what a guitar is supposed to feel like. Their guitars played so much better than these things I was making. Right. And I was like, all right, I'd be stupid not to do this. It just, it feels good. It sounds good, it, 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 everything. So I met up with Patrice, the head of the company. And we went out to dinner and just got to know each other, just chatting and talking about things. And and we said, yeah, let's do it. Uh, I really like the guy. And that's an important thing. You need people in your life that you like. Uh, I would say even before the gear, you have to have that. Because <coughs> if these people are going to be in your life for 22 years, you want it to be someone that's like family. And they are. Uh, that's important to me. And besides that, they just make a damn good guitar. Mm -hmm. it, it feels great. Uh, and they were willing to entertain my odd whims about making strange guitars. I told them, I said, making these strange guitars is part of my you know, self-expression. And I don't want to lose that mm -hmm. to play just a stock standard guitar, no matter how great it plays. Uh, and they were willing to do that stuff. So they made a guitar that looked like a foot with stripes on it where you bend down the Floyd bar and wings would pop out of the sides. It was the greatest thing. And that was my main did guitar for a very long well? time. They did not. I guess we did a version too. We could have wiggling toes. Okay. Uh, That's great that you found a company that shares that kind of vision though. Cause it did, yeah. and, and they remade the Swiss cheese guitar for you they as well, did. didn't they? Yeah, they made exact replicas, just a limited amount, I think 11 of them. And and they just nailed it. So they were making a fretless guitar. I had no idea. Uh, I was making sort of fretless-ish guitars on my own. I made one where I ripped off everything, all the frets, and, and filled it up with coins. I think it was $4.63. And just filled in the spaces with some goop I made out of epoxy and sawdust and God knows what else. Shaved it all down, and, and it sounded like crap. Mm. But I was happy because it was just weird. And it was something interesting and had a different kind of sound to it. Uh, but I didn't know they made a fretless guitar. And it was 1998, we, uh, or even 99, but it was around then and we went to the NAMM show together. And I saw that thing, I was like, why didn't you tell me about this? It was like, nobody likes them, no one plays them. We've sold three in the last 18 years or whatever it was. Hey, well, please let me have one and I will absolutely use the shit out of this thing. <laughs> Took it home and immediately just started writing all kinds of interesting music. It makes you write riffs and things that you wouldn't on a fretted. Yeah. Uh, it just lends itself in that direction to, to that kind of thing. And it became a big part of what I do. But for all those years, I had to choose between fretted or fretless. Either I'm playing a whole song on a fretless, which you may not always want to do, or a fretted where you're like, ah, it would be real nice to just have a break here where I could mm -hmm. do something on that. So 10 years ago, finally did it and made the double neck. And it's my main guitar. I use it for everything, for Sons of Apollo, uh, main guitar where this one's drop D, this is drop B, like a seventh string of a seven string. Right. Uh, for my own stuff and uh, yeah, this is 
The ultimate no. two-in-one. Mm -hmm. And it has everything that I need from a guitar. It has a uh, Demarzio Tone Zone and a chopper. This is as a humbucker and as a single coil. The two together, the two out of phase, and then just this one. It has a magnetized hole to hold my thimble. Uh, this metal cap that I keep on my finger when I've run out of frets to press the string against, I press this against the string and I could get continued notes going all the way up. All right, what are we doing? We are shortening the length of string via the fret. We are touching the string to a metal fret. We are touching a metal fret to the string. Okay, so all we have to do is touch a mobile metal fret. I keep a thimble on this finger that I touch down to the string. That is my mobile fret that I am touching to the string. So once I've gone beyond the fretboard, and you can keep it going. And that's what I'm doing. And that's where I'm getting all the other notes that are there. So. Problem solved. Now. And a little magnet in there so that I'll just snap off my finger and stay put. Uh, yeah. yeah. Here's your so volume. Lot. volume. I put uh, some stuff inside here. It's a little capacitor and resistor that as you roll down the volume, it adds brightness so that as it would normally get darker, it balances it out and you always stay at the same brightness that you have on 10, you'll have that on one or anything in between. So like a kind of treble bleed kind mm -hmm. of a thing? Yeah. And yeah, I'm using like, I don't know what I'm talking about terminology, nice. putting some extra guts so that it stays mm -hmm. bright. So you have this right here, you have both together and you have this with a separate volume knob for here and for here. And the five-way toggle for this, five-way toggle for this. It does have a kill switch hidden in there, right there, that I really never use. Uh, I used it for all the Chinese democracy stuff with guns, uh, all the stuff when I had to cover uh, Buckethead stuff, and he mm. was the master of the kill switch, for sure, is the master of the kill switch. He uses it as greatly as, as that switch can be used. And so, and it's good for the Ace Freely thing too. Oh yeah, kind of like yeah, you can do that. Mm, uh, 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 okay, yeah, yeah. yeah this with is the true. right amount of feedback. Mm -hmm. So I mean, this is a crazy guitar, but it obviously works for you. But this isn't just a one-off. This is a production. Oh yeah, they model. make this thing. This is my signature series double neck. Uh, we have a signature series uh, single neck as well. Mm -hmm. But this is the one. This is a double neck, and people are getting it. There are people I know yeah. that that have gotten. The double neck. So if you guys are interested, they are available. And if you know if it is a little bit too much, the standard stri six string will do it as well. Um, and you know, Vigio always pioneered the fretless thing, as you were talking about before. They really kind of brought that to mass attention. But I think you probably helped propel that even further for them. Oh, well, team effort. Yeah. It's a good. It's a good partnership. And you know, every we're really proud to have Vigio here at Peach. We're one of the only. Uh, dealers in the UK that, that do. Um, you know, we've featured Vigiers on the channel quite recently. They always cool. sound great, they always play great. Yeah. And it, it is that kind of, you just want an absolutely perfectly functional instrument, but it helps if it looks great as, at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. So we're looking forward to the rest of the, uh, the, of what you've got in store for us for the rest of the clinic and stuff like that tonight. And we notice that you're using a Helix. Yeah, well. yeah, I'm, I've been a Line 6 guy since the Pod 2.0, back in like 2001, maybe even earlier. Uh, I always thought the company was just really pushing things to the next place. Mm -hmm. And the Helix sounds fantastic. And I, I've used all the, you know, I've used the Kemper, I've used Fractal, uh, used Helix, and all of them are great. Uh, they really are, and they just keep getting better. Um, more features, better sounds, uh, everything. Uh, but the Helix, once I found the right IR, impulse response, to put in the chain mm -hmm. of all the blocks of, that are each you know, doing something for it, uh, it was like putting the right Instagram filter on a photo that just brings out things. And that's what IRs do. And you want to find some good ones. There's a lot of... Uh, people out there that just make them and, and it's like taking a wave shape 
and just like this invisible nothing wave that uh, sounds like a certain microphone at a certain distance at a certain angle against a certain kind of speaker uh, of a certain wattage and is modeled and once you insert that at the end of the chain it really sounds like it's going through that and it adds a realism a feeling of moving air and it makes all the difference mm -hmm. so yeah that's i think that line six uh helix they, they really nailed it yeah they did it's it's it takes some dialing in like you said but but the thing about them is that you can just look at a helix and you can just figure it out from staring at it and mm -hmm. you can make your sound it's not like you have to read a manual for a week no. it's very user friendly and it's yeah. once you've got it all figured out, it's the most convenient thing in the world for a oh, guitar yeah. player, especially a traveling guitar player. Yeah, I've used it on huge festival stages, and I'm going to use it here uh, and everything in between. And it doesn't matter. It's uh, reliable, consistent, sounds good, can do it all. And the cool thing about it is that their native plugin, any presets you make are interchangeable. So whatever sounds you have here, you can put right into your DAW. And you're good to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's a perfect marriage of guitar, the right unit, the right hands, and the right approach. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I think we could talk for a lot, lot longer, Ron, but we've got to get ready for this clinic. We've got to get some food, keep those hands and the voice warmed up. So it's an absolute yeah. pleasure to meet you. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks Thank so you so much, much for, for having to us. me. It's great to be here. It's our yeah. pleasure. So guys, if yeah. you're interested in Vigier, this is the place to come get down to Peach Guitars and check them out. Check out the website, peachguitars.com, if you want to see the current uh, inventory of what we've got. There's plenty more models coming in. And if you want something like this, then get in touch. So thanks so much for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Thank you very much.